This is, uh, is, is going to be a little bit ham, but I'm afraid there's a little bit of part 15 in this, so, so bear with me. Um, a lot of this work actually uh, sort of was one of the things that sort of got me going on, uh, on wanting to be a ham. Let's start off with a little pop quiz. What do these three things have in common? Okay, this is, a, this is, this is Hedy Lamar. We've got spread spectrum, and then we have something over here that's a patent that's a, a, a secret communication system by H.K. Markey. Well, it turns out that H.K. Markey is actually Hedy Lamar. Uh, she, uh, she basically had uh, been married to a, a German arms merchant in Germany uh, during the development of the Nazi period. She didn't particularly like the Nazis. As a matter of fact, she really didn't like the Nazis. So, but uh, she was constantly being asked to, her husband did not want her out of his, her, his sight for some reason. So uh, she sat in on a lot of meetings and she learned a lot about the fact that they were concerned with jamming torpedo systems and things like that. And she started to have some ideas about how maybe to fix that problem, but she didn't want to tell them about it. So then when she came over to the U.S., uh, 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 met uh, Goldwyn on the ship over, got a contract, famous mm -hmm. actress. Mm -hmm. She still got together with a, another fellow. There's a, another author on this patent here. And basically the idea <coughs> was that you would take and couple a radio that was capable of transmitting on several different frequencies here to a paper tape that would basically have like a piano roll on it. And when the little blip came by for one particular one, it would transmit on that frequency. And the jammers would say, oh, we got to jam that frequency. And they'd go over and try to jam it. And then, but then the next dot would come along. It would go to a different frequency. On the other hand, on the receiver, there'd also be one of those rolls. And so it would be changing the, the receive frequency in synchrony with the transmit frequency. Nobody in the middle was listening to a single frequency would have any sense of what was going on, and it would be really difficult to jam. She donated it for free to the Navy. She did ultimately make a little bit of money on it, but it was when uh, some uh, a magazine discovered that she had done that, and then they published her photo on the front cover of their magazine, and they forgot to get the rights to the photo. <laughs> and so, uh, so she did that. This, this is a public domain photo here. Uh, anyway, the, uh, the big thing with, uh, with spread spectrum is that basically what you have is instead of focusing on getting something through on one single frequency, you're basically using much lower power at a bunch of different frequencies to, to, send, uh, to send data through. Now that, uh, one of, yeah, and so one of the advantages of that is that if you've got something blocking that single frequency, well, it isn't likely to block the other, frequ the other frequencies that you might be using. So at least some of the data is getting through. If you've got error correction built in there so, so that you've got redundancy, then you can still recover the signal even if there's noise. As a matter of fact, a lot of times spread spectrum radios actually operate at or below the level of the noise floor. They just basically sort of reinforce the noise or don't reinforce the noise in order to, to, to make it, uh, it come through. Um, now, Spread spectrum is allowed only on parts of the, the amateur spectrum. So basically, uh, there's a little tiny bit of VHF where you're allowed to do it. Mostly where it's used is in the, the higher frequencies. This is in part because if you're going to have to be sending all these error correcting bits along, you want to have the ability to send lots and lots and lots of bits. Higher frequencies sort of give you that, that ability to, to do that. Um, now, what I'm going to be, be talking about, uh, oh, well, and the other thing also about uh, one of the reasons that the Navy never actually used Hedy Lamarr's uh, thing to control torpedoes was they had a really hard time getting the uh, uh, getting clocks that were accurate enough to keep the tapes moving at the same rate. 
Okay, if you're dealing with paper tapes, it's real easy to see how they might skip or jump, especially when you happen to be in a torpedo that's just been fired out of a submarine or is, that's pounding through the water. All sorts, of, uh, all sorts of problems there. Now, a lot of those problems were dealt with with the, the advent of, of computers. Uh, the other thing that also kept people from using this a lot was the fact that uh, it was uh, kept top secret for, for quite a long time period. Basically, because this was ideal for covert communications, nobody who was listening for spies sending communications back could hear a signal on any given frequency. Just imagine uh, listening for CQ, CQ, of where every time somebody's sending a character, they're sending it on a different frequency, maybe even on a different band. Just imagine how difficult it would be to work that, uh, that, that contact. So, uh, so the advent of, uh, of computers that were capable of doing it, of, of working with it, is sort of a big, big part of it there. Now, what I'm going to talk about is using this spread spectrum equipment to uh, do some things that you can't do as a ham. This, some of the stuff is stuff that I was doing at work before I was a ham. And secondly, you cannot do ham radio in order to do your work. I mean, that's, that's the, the basics of it. But there's nothing that I'm going to be talking about doing with part 15 stuff that you couldn't also do with ham stuff. Okay, so that's, that's it. Now, what the background is, is I work with this research project, the Virginia Coast Reserve Long-Term Ecological Research Project. And we do studies over on the eastern shore of Virginia. As a matter of fact, uh, yesterday morning I was flying back and forth on an airplane across this, uh, the, the, the coast there uh, filming where all of the ice flows were because we needed to know what islands were being connected or disconnected with respect to animals uh, passing, uh, passing through them there. Uh, but anyway, we do, uh, are doing research out on this system and it's a big system. And we need to, to do monitoring out there. This is a picture of one of the, the barrier islands. This is, this is Hog Island um, off the coast of Virginia. It was right about in the middle of the, of the chain there. Uh, it's right there. How many miles is it from the coast? Uh, basically, this is a, about, uh, it's about eight miles from the coast here. And it's, uh, tw uh, I have to translate it from kilometers, but it's 22 kilometers from this red star, which is our lab on the mainland, to about here on the island, which is where we make our connection. The, uh, anyway, the island, it's, this particular island itself is about eight miles long. Um, and has a, a variety of different, uh, different land cover on it. Now, one of the reasons that we're, we were interested in doing wireless was in order to look at a part of the, this graph that, that isn't there, okay? This is a graph of studies from, uh, from one of the ecological journals. And so what we did was went through and looked to see how often did they make measurements. So things along this axis here, all those little stars there that actually span the axis, they were just done once. They only, they didn't do it again. Uh, there's others of them that were done then monthly out to once a second. The other axis is how big was the area they were covering, okay? So we've got a situation here where they were covering a really small area once a second. Okay, they were covering, in this case here, a really big area, but they only did it once. Okay, but what's missing in this graph is everything up here. Where the heck is all of the stuff where you're looking at high frequency and also over big areas? And the answer is that that tends to be the place where if you do have studies that have wireless sensor networks, that's the type of thing those can deal with. You can get that high frequency data and you can do it over a big area. The, um, so one of the things that we have done was we had the goal of, uh, of monitoring the environment. So we've got these, these monitoring stations. I'll talk a little bit more about them in a, in a second, but uh, we have meteorological stations. We have what are called carbon flux towers. 
that are all, all, all fancy technical, collect data at 10 hertz, which is pretty fast <laughs> for, for data coming at you. And then, uh, and then tide <coughs> stations and things like that. Another thing that we uh, wanted to do was to have it so that we were now in the field, we could uh, have access to the internet for maybe <coughs> I need to look something up, maybe I need to uh, 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 communicate with somebody. When we started doing this, it was before the time that 3G was available, okay? So there was no, it, uh, I went to one meeting and they said, why don't you use 3G? And I said, because they don't have 3G on the Eastern Shore of Virginia. And they didn't have it for about another six or seven years. Now, no problem, you got it. Uh, but anyway, that ability to, to get that access to information. And then the other thing is, uh, is images, okay? If, uh, if you're wondering why the heck Hog Island is looking so white, that's because these pictures are from this morning. Okay? Well, for some reason, we were having trouble taking a boat across this ice-filled bay up here in order to go out here and take these pictures. So if it wasn't for the fact that we were able to send this data back wirelessly, we wouldn't have the data. And right now, I would pull you up this webcam and let you look around at it and point the camera wherever you wanted to point it. But the problem is it's dark. And we do not have a floodlight system out there. So about all you would be able to see is some, uh, are some blinking lights on towers on the mainland. So I'll, I'll, I'll forego that. Um, the, um, basically, what we did was, uh, was set up a link between our lab, which is, uh, is here, and, uh, and the southern end of Hog Island. Okay, that's, uh, this is a 900 megahertz link. It's not the fastest link in the world, but uh, it, it, it's basically spanning 22 kilometers of open water. Okay, just, it, by the way, everything we're talking about here is using less than a watt. This is, this is by definition QRP stuff here. Okay. So this is, you're aiming a, a Yagi or something. Yeah, yeah, but you'll, you'll see on, on the tower itself, we have, we have got a big antenna. Uh, the, um, and then basically uh, what uh, I did is this is a GIS analysis basically sort of showing the, the, the yellow area there are all of the, and that could be green because I'm colorblind. Whatever this color is, those are the places we should be able to reach from the two towers that we have, one on the north end and one on the south end of Hog, and I'll show you, show you those in a, in a second. The, um, so here's our, our main thing, Broadwater Tower. Okay, I told you about uh, Hedy Lamar and World War II. We owe this tower to World War II. This is a U-boat lookout tower built in 1942 to help defend the Virginia coast from, from U-boats. Uh, the, uh, and then on it, we have, uh, have a variety of equipment. Uh, one of the things, EJ, AJ, you were talking about the antenna. This is our antenna. That's about a four foot diameter dish wow. there. Now, mind you, the truth be told, it really would work with a couple of Yaggies, high gain Yaggies. Okay, we have done it with high Hello, gain Yaggies. Yeah, yeah. But I have to say, the big problem was the winds out there were just ripping our Yaggies to pieces. We used to have to tie, uh, we used to have to stabilize both ends of the Yaggie, and even then they just wore out really quickly. This thing here has been uh, pretty solid. We lost one to a lightning strike, but other than that, they've been, they've been pretty good. I guess that's the tallest thing, huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, though it's interestingly enough, it either doesn't get hit very often or we don't, uh, uh, we've been lucky. Because we've only had, we only had once where it really cooked everything down and welded all the pieces together. <laughs> uh, basically, well, the thing is that the tower itself is, is steel. Yeah. Oh, oh the, the dish, no, well, the, no, it's just, it's just this. There's no finer mesh. Uh, the spaces are probably, I don't know, I guess maybe about two inches uh, spacing there. But this is designed for 900 megahertz, so it's, uh, it, uh, it, it works with that. Uh, at the uh, top of the tower, we have a, an equipment box, and this is sort of a, a bit of a mess up there, okay? It's really just a, a waterproof box because the top of the tower is no longer waterproof for some reason. <laughs> there seem to be lots of holes since 1942 that have come in on the roof. 
and uh, and that contains our, our our radio for that, and then we have another access point that then transmits the data out to other places on the island using more standard Wi-Fi. The power system for it is down at the bottom of the tower. We've got about 10 solar panels down there clamped to the tower. And we have a, a box with our batteries. And I, I, this is our old box. Do you, can you tell why we might have wanted a new box? That's because that one is full of wasps. <laughs> those are all wasps. Now, fortunately, those are now dead wasps. <laughs> but they weren't that way when we opened it up. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, no, it's, it, there's, there's all sorts of interesting things going on out there. But we've got a solar controller and a, and a timer, because we usually shut the network down at night, because uh, certainly the cameras and stuff aren't seeing much then. So why? Uh, why do that? Um, so that's, uh, that's our primary <laughs> node there. Uh, we also have one on the north end of the island uh, on a little uh, flag tower from a Coast Guard station there. Now this is a, one where we have a little more room and so we could organize things a little bit better. <laughs> Needless to say, this board, these boards are not up on the tower. They're in the little house down below there. So did you guys have to get that there or was that left by the Coast Guard? The platform was left by the Coast Guard, but one of our guys actually built the little house. So he did a, did a great job on that. And so what we have here are a, uh, a, a fuse that sort of fuses the whole system here. We've got our solar controller. Solar power comes in. It connects to the battery, and then it also sends out the load. And then we'll also cut things off if, in fact, the battery gets too low. So we've got some security there. We have our little timer that turns things on and off there. We have a, a couple of items that actually really are happier if they've got AC power. So we do uh, take uh, uh, this up and run it through an inverter. Uh, we have our sort of our bus there. We have an inverter that, uh, that then powers this um, uh, thing. I guess I'm trying to see where the inverter got to. I think it's hid somewhere. Anyway, the, uh, to, to power uh, some of the equipment that wants AC. But as far as we can, we try to keep it 24 volts. The amount of problems we have is almost inversely related to the proximity to an inverter. <laughs> Inverters are wonderful things in, when they work. <laughs> uh, the, uh, we then have, a, have another section of thing over here that's dealing with the data. What this is here is a data logger that's recording information from a wind gauge that we have up on top of the tower. And needless to say, we've got a little box up here that then relays the internet signals and, and things like that up there. Uh, we, that then goes to a serial to ethernet converter, because the data logger doesn't know diddly about the internet, it just knows about uh, uh, about serial data, we can then connect that to our hub, and then that can go to up the tower to our Wi-Fi radio up there, and is sent back to, to Broadwater Tower there. Uh, so is that equally as big? Yeah. No, this, this one's only about this big. Oh, like a dish, like a dish Yeah, this is this is yeah, this is uh, just about the it was smaller than a dish network but, one, so, so substantially smaller than it. Uh, curiously enough, though, it still gets uh, sort of, I was doing a, a site scan on it the other day to sort of see what things it could see. And at one point there, it actually picked up the upper level of a hotel room in Virginia Beach. <laughs> okay, and Virginia Beach is probably about 40 miles, 40, 50 miles away. So anyway, I would not, you couldn't guarantee all that, yeah. Just a question, I'm sorry. I missed what you said about power. When you get low power, does that automatically uh, yeah. uh, kind of shed, load, load shed uh, your loads? Or does it do well, the, 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 okay, let's, uh, let's uh, talk. Uh, the, the, the radio, all of the radios that we're using are using less than one watt okay. of, uh, of, of power. Okay. Yeah, tra tra yeah tra transmit receive, and receive. It's not the lowest power radios we have. The lowest power radios we have go through this little thing. This is a, a 900 megahertz serial radio. It doesn't have the bandwidth. It can't transmit nearly as much data as quickly as the, as the Wi-Fi does. But it's, uh, it's one that's extremely low power and allows us to talk to these data loggers that we have out at different locations. But I guess my question yeah. was, do you run into instances where 
you don't have enough power. Oh, yeah, I will talk about that in a minute, but the other thing that I didn't show you is that the other side of this roof here is covered with solar panels. Mm -hmm. So the truth be told, right now, power is not so much an issue for us. Oh. We could probably run it 24 hours on the number of solar panels that we have up there now, because we, we sort of figured that having too much power was not a problem. Uh, having too little power, we, we've, we tried that and we don't want to do it again. Uh, the, um, and then, of course, we've just got our hub here that's then connecting up to the, uh, to the, the, this one connects to the south end of the island. We have another antenna here that is then just transmitting Wi-Fi out onto the island that uh, can be connected to by some of our, our stations there. So that way, if you're on the boat, you have connectivity. Uh, yeah, you, you can be standing on the boat pulling out your cell phone and connecting up with Wi-Fi. Now, this is, a, this is jumping a little bit back to the mainland here, but this is an example of one of our stations here. What we've got is a, uh, a radar-based uh, water level sensor, which is vastly superior because for some reason, none of the barnacles tend to grow on our radar unit that have to be suspended about eight feet above the water. Uh, the other thing that's also nice about it is it's a digital sensor. So it's actually sending the data back over the wire as a serial data stream. Okay, so it can, it can use a really fairly stupid data logger. It, you don't require a lot of sensitive analog to digital conversion circuitry and that sort of thing there. And then again, we have that issue of the data logger wants to talk serial, we want to talk Wi-Fi, so we have to do the conversion there, and then we've got that antenna. Now, in this case here, it's just going a couple hundred feet back to our lab. Okay, this is, is on the dock in, in Oyster. Uh, the, um, we also have, uh, have some wells out on, out on Hog Island. Okay, these are ones that are using a Yagi antenna up there. You can see it up at the top of the station. And these, uh, some of these uh, data loggers actually have built in 900 megahertz radios that are extremely power frugal. So that tiny little solar panel up there like this, even if it's fairly shaded, is more than enough to, to power these things. You run them on tiny little uh, you know, 12 amp hour batteries, no, no big stuff involved. Uh, and they, but again, they're also not shooting back megabits of data. This is basically sending maybe a, a line or two of data each hour. It's not, uh, it's not doing it at a, at a tremendous rate there. So you're trying to figure out what the groundwater level is? Right. So what we have down in the uh, hole here, the, you can see a well here, is we basically have a pressure sensor down there. That, and again, that's a digital pressure sensor. So it's actually giving a serial stream back up to the up to the logger there. It's using something called SDI-12. And the SDI part, I'm not sure what it means, but the 12 is 1,200 baud, which tells you how fast it can go. Uh, the, um, the, uh, we, uh, this is uh, one of our uh, meteorological stations out there. This one, we're actually using uh, Wi-Fi to send it back. You can see our little, uh, little antenna up here. And we have uh, that little white tube there is the radio. And I will, uh, forgot to bring them up with me. But uh, here are a couple of the, the things. Right now, actually, I've replaced that one. Believe it or not, the tube blew off, OK, the, the, on, that, the, on that antenna. So I've replaced it with one of these. This is an integrated Wi-Fi radio and antenna together that I could just clamp to the pole. But this is uh, one of the, what they call their bullet radios. This one actually survived a fire. So it's, if it's a little smudge, that's why. But basically what this has is a, uh, an ethernet connection on one end of it that you feed with power over ethernet. So all the power and the data come through together. And then you just uh, take and, uh, so you run an ethernet cable through the little hole there, plug it in, tighten that up. It's got good gaskets and all of that stuff. And then just screw this to your antenna of choice with a standard end connector. And so that's what we were, are using with this one. And that's also what we used on that other, other station. The other beautiful thing about these is these run less than $100.
Is that a watt also? Uh, yeah, it's a, it, well, I think it's maybe more like half a watt, but it's good enough to cover a very good distance. Uh, the other thing also about it, them that I like is that they're all programmable using a web page because it's actually got a little Linux computer on on this as well. So the antenna, everything is in there. Right? Well, this, this one doesn't have the antenna in it. This one does. These two are basically identical in terms of their functions. Except that one doesn't. Except this one, this one lets you pick whatever antenna you want. Obviously, keeping at the gain such that you're not exceeding the the limits for Part 15. Yeah. Is that a dipole on top? Uh, that, that one is actually a Yagi. The antenna I'm talking about is the tube here, and that's basically yeah. a Yagi oh, antenna inside up. the tube. Yeah, the straight up here, that's a lightning protector. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, 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 big fan, we're big fans of lightning protection. And in this case here, the, 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 the logger is, and the measuring system is running off that little solar panel and my Wi-Fi is running off the big solar panel. And near the twain show me, because we've drained a few batteries a few times with a, a radio that maybe didn't shut off when it was supposed to, and we don't want to lose our monitoring. So the logger will keep collecting data and saving it, even if it can't send it back uh, immediately. Yeah? That uh, bullet, I yeah. used one of those. Uh, I was working on a project, but I was setting it up. And I Pass it around there. It was a parabolic uh, 2.4 gig. Uh, a little parabolic dish about that big. And I'm 40, I'm probably 40 couple of miles from Wintergreen. I can see from my front porch, I can see the lights at the ski slope. Well, I was out there like you were, just fritzing around, did a little, what do I see? And I actually got on two unsecured routers in Wintergreen. Yeah, no, it's 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 pretty remarkable what you what you can do with some of these little things. And I have to say, I, I'm a big. I, I don't want to do sort of too much. Uh, um, uh, advertising for ubiquity, but I've just been really impressed with a lot of the things they do because they're really designed to work outside. We, we used to have to do this with a lot of radios that were designed to work inside, and this is better. <laughs> Yeah. Just the, the bullet because it doesn't have the antenna. Oh, the bullet, the bullet I think maybe is $79, yeah, something like that. That stuff's all dirt cheap. The, yeah, the, uh, uh, and the, uh, uh, there's, yeah, the, and there's all, sor all sorts of choices there. Uh, this is our, our carbon uh, flux tower. This one is located, again, about another 15 kilometers from our, uh, stay, our tower out on Hog Island. You can see me there holding a little directional antenna, 2.4 gigahertz antenna, and yes, that is talking to the tower. We have a bit bigger antenna on the tower. Okay. Uh, all these little stations are all just talking to one of the bigger ones on the island. Right, and then they, because these stations here, well, I'll talk a little bit about the, about the limitation, but uh, uh, one of the limitations is uh, the fact that Wi-Fi 2.4 gigahertz loveth not vegetation. And so I can't, we couldn't, we would not want to shoot that one directly back from here to here because it would have it be having to go through a lot more. Also, uh, you know, again, we've got that really big antenna for connecting here to here for a solid thing. So it's actually easier to do a two-leg cop than a one. Yeah. What's carbon flux? Basically, what, we're to what we are doing here is we are trying to, you know that when, uh, when plants and animals breathe, they spit out CO2? And you know when plants, uh, I know that about and when and when plants are pulling in that sunlight in the water and they're growing, they're 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 taking CO2 out of the air and changing it into leaves and all those good things. Well, one of the issues that we try to get at in uh, in ecology is how much of that is happening, how much respiration is happening versus how much production is happening. Okay, and what this tower does is it has a bunch of sonic anemometers. That's one of the these things that sort of have weird little fingers that you probably can't see very well. Here is a sonic anemometer. It measures every tenth of a second what the direction the wind is, and then we have a uh, an instrument that is sucking in air and measuring how much CO2 is in that air. And by knowing what direction the wind came from for how long, we can figure where the heck that where was 
when a plant was in contact with it. So it basically <laughs> gives you a way of doing those sorts of bal carbon balance measurements over a bigger area. And so that, that's, the, and that's the only explanation of carbon flux you're going to get out of me, because I still think there's some black magic in there myself. <laughs> OK? <laughs> so uh, the, uh, but anyway, this thing, these things measure at 10 hertz. So we're talking about 5 gigabytes of data per year. We need to get this data back to the uh, things. And then also we've got, uh, we've done, uh, We've had a bunch of webcams that we've used for everything like monitoring uh, particular places or uh, uh, monitoring particular wildlife. So are all these barrier islands protected? The general the, public can't go there? Well, the, the answer is the general public can go there, but they are protected from development for the most part because the Nature Conservancy owns about 14 of them. The state owns a couple of them, and the feds own a couple of them. And there's a couple of them that are, are anybody can build there that they want to, but the problem is the island's moving so darn fast that all their houses keep ending up in the surf. <laughs> so uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful place not to build a permanent structure. I didn't point it out to you, but at the bottom of our 1942 tower is the remains of the 1919 tower that they tore down in the 1940s because it was about to get underwashed and carried out to sea. So uh, anyway, the, there were some parts that weren't salvageable. So anyway, what we did was we started off, we had you know internet at our lab on the, the mainland. We had the, the different towers. So what we did was first of all set up uh, the, that 900 megahertz link out to Broadwater Tower, the old U-boat tower then connected that to the Machapango Station Tower on the north end of the island where we were doing more monitoring. Uh, then, we, uh, then we connected up a bunch of stuff, okay, uh, to, to different, uh, to different uh, places there. So we've got cameras that looked at Falcons with the help of the folks at William & Mary. So it's really neat. They, a pair of bald eagles set up a nest right next to one of our <laughs> stations there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, uh, and then, yeah, and then we've added, added additional stations sort of as we go along. But it's really nice to sort of have that infrastructure there to, to do that. So the results are we've got ways of getting our data back. We have ways of looking at what's going on. Uh, we, we had this running when Hurricane Isabel came through a few years ago, so you could actually watch the water coming up below the tower. It got real exciting, though, because it's really clear that at one point the camera's going like this, <laughs> because it's, it's got this, like, blur. And when the camera was finished, it didn't point to the same place it was when we started with it. Uh, anyway. Uh, but it withstood the, uh, the hurricane at the end of the day. Yep, yep. But, uh, but this sort of flooding is something that you just see every day. That's, that's, you know, the, that's the tides out there. What was the 1919 tower? The, the 1919 tower was a, uh, a um, uh, gosh, lighthouse. Oh, okay. 19, I should have said 1919 Lighthouse. That would have helped. I, I was so hung up on tower there. Anyway, the, the cameras are, have turned out to be useful for if you don't want to disturb the critters. Um, yeah, challenges. Okay, wear and tear. This was one I just replaced a couple a week ago. That's what the bracket looked like. <laughs> That's from the salt. Yeah, the, the salt has completely corroded that. And, and even the fiberglass here has been deformed and just, just nasty. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, this is the, our MET station out on Hog Island. I went out there because it had stopped sending us stuff. And it turns out that what happened is some animal had pulled the top off our battery case, pulled it about 25 feet away from it, leaving it fully exposed. And at the same time, it also broken the wire that ran up to ran our radio. So uh, we've also had problems with deer getting tangled in the uh, in cables coming down from solar panels and ripping those out as well. So uh, life is not always easy. And then I've got my, uh, my leaf there for block signals, OK? 2.4 gigahertz does not like to go through vegetation. 900 megahertz is better, uh, but basically you really want to be above uh, that sort of thing. So you're not going to power with, well, with a uh, 
the frequency of these things is not so grossly different than a microwave oven. Okay, your microwave oven is 700 watts, and if you put leaves and stuff in there, it'll heat those leaves <coughs> up really quick, because basically all of the water molecules are absorbing all that, uh, that uh, radiation coming out of your microwave oven. Well, <coughs> these things are essentially a microwave oven that is much less than a watt. <laughs> And so what come, what's left over after you've tried to heat the leaves up is pretty much not worth talking about. Yeah. So that's the, that's the uh, problem there. Uh, you talked about, I'll tell you what, I'll, Joe, I'm going to take your, your toy here and pass it around for the others to look at here. I will also pop this one open so that you can see what the... Uh, um, what the connectors on this look like, because this does allow you to also hook a, next, a different antenna on it if you want. Uh, yeah. No, th this, is, this one drove me absolutely crazy, because how in the world do you take and completely melt down a fuse holder without blowing the fuse? <laughs> I, I mean, of all things. <laughs> Well, the, my hypothesis on it <laughs> is that what had happened is that we had gotten a little bit of buildup of oxidation. And so what was happening was that we were getting a voltage drop between where the cable came in and where it connected to the fuse. And since, since the rest of the circuit was, uh, at that point, this was on a charging circuit, it, it basically, it overheated and completely melted the, the body of the fuse before it ever did anything to the fuse itself. But, the, but I will say to you that, uh, that in running these sorts of systems, if something goes down, my immediate impulse is, what happened to our power? <laughs> okay, I'm not saying that antennas don't occasionally die, I'm not saying that radios don't occasionally die, but power <coughs> systems seem to be sort of the weak link in a lot of it, which is why we've gone to, to 12 volts for a lot of it. Now, and as much as I love, uh, love power poles, they really are not designed for outdoor environments. <laughs> uh, so we make a weather resistant flavor of those things? Uh, I, I, I don't know if they do. We, generally speaking, try to, to make it so that we're very often either soldering or, or using butt connectors to, to, to hook things together in a, in a more solid way. Is that an Ethernet cable going into that? Uh, no, that's actually, that, that's, I think, a, a 20 amp, uh, or excuse me, a 30 amp, uh, like maybe a, what is it, either 10 or 12 gauge wire going into it there. Uh, and then it, and then you can actually see that this is a 25 amp fuse there that's been completely <laughs> completely melted. So anyway, power is 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 one of the things you're going to have to have to wrestle with. So this is sort of the, the the picture of you know all of the things that we were using that uh, that network for. So then I guess when you go out, you've got to bring sort of a grab bag of. What if? I've got I've got a, uh, a quite the what if collection, <laughs> uh, but it, uh, and sometimes what you have to do is sometimes you have to go out and diagnose and then come back and fix. That's that's just the the nature of the the beast. You can't keep that much stuff on hand. Yeah, but fortunately those radios are real light, so those sorts of things are easy. If your batteries are the thing, you probably don't want to cart around too much if you can help it. Well, talk about batteries more. Why? Yeah. And when using a 12 volt versus 24 volt? Uh, let's see. Well, we have uh, the. It is true that we could take mostly what we're using are deep cycle marine batteries out there, and they come in 12 volts. And while we certainly could hook them together to make 24 volts, we then also right now we're just running the solar panels in parallel. They put out about 17 volts. So we'd have to start doing them serially in pairs. So generally speaking, we've just stuck with 12 volts. We don't have any really long power cable runs so that we're not seeing sort of a lot of loss, which is where the advantage of having higher voltage comes in, is that the you know, amount of heating and the amount of loss you get in a given cable is going to be depending on what the, the current is, not the voltage. And hence, hence the reason they got these 10,000 volt lines <laughs> running all over the place. Uh, but, uh, but we've just generally sort of stuck to 12 volts to sort of, sort of keep it simple there. 
Uh, now, I want to go back. We've talked, we've been in part 15 land. Let's go back to part 97 <laughs> land. Okay. Uh, these were business related applications. Can't do those on ham, but there's nothing that I was doing that a ham can't do if a ham wants to do it for their own purposes. If you want to do it for work, no, you can't do it as a ham. If you want to do it for your own interest because you've got, you'd like to have a webcam at the back of your property, no problem. You want to, you want to send, uh, have a full-time video system to, to watch your grandkids three miles away. If you can rig it up, no problem. Uh, the, uh, if their parents will let you do it, no problem. Uh, so anyway, uh, I, uh, the, these sorts of things are, are available. Now, a good example of that is the stuff that Mike has been talking to the club several times about, which is the, the mesh networking. Because this is, these, can, these sorts of radios that have really, really high data rates and, you know, the hundreds of megabits per second range, they can handle voice over IP, they can handle sending images, they can ha send, send video, they can send lots and lots of stuff. And you can use those for controlling repeaters, you can use them for uh, sending emergency information back and forth, uh, forth really quickly. They're also relatively easy to configure so that you can make it so that, uh, you know, if a new radio shows up on the, you know, on the scene, you don't have to go and reprogram every other radio that was out there to talk to it. So those are some good things there. And a lot of these uh, radios, and Mike will be the one you should ask, <laughs> uh, you know, can be reprogrammed to work on ham frequencies. It's not a question of having to go in and solder in a bunch of coils in order to, to make them work. Um, the, uh, the, the, the last thought I will leave you with is uh, we have been seeing an island, okay? Uh, islands on the air does in fact list various islands in Virginia as being part of the, the Virginia state group. Uh, I think there have been uh, on the order of 30 activations of the Virginia state group. Uh, so, so it isn't that it hasn't been done before, but if there's somebody that would really like to take the lead on setting up an IOTA expedition, this is one that probably won't require $100,000 to pull off. And, uh, and I think I can promise that we would find some way to, to accidentally dangle your dipole off one of our towers. Uh, <laughs> I don't really propose to string it between the two pat towers since they're about eight miles apart. <laughs> yeah, unless you want to operate on the, on some of those new new super low bands. <laughs> but anyway, the, those are uh, just uh, just mention that and that this by the way is a picture of Hog Island yesterday. That's uh, that's the, the that was uh, as we were flying around looking for the ice out here that pretty well have blanketed the bays out there. But uh, with that, are there, uh, are there any questions? Yeah. How is this funded? Okay, this was uh, is part of a National Science Foundation project, hence uh, at the very bottom here I've got NSF. Okay, this is a, a project that, that has about 20 different PhD level researchers associated with it at maybe seven or eight different institutions. Uh, and my job is basically working with their data and doing a lot of this, having this fun. But you can see why ham radio became very attractive to me after having done this for several years. <laughs> Any other questions? Excellent. Okay. Thank you. And yes, eventually I do want all those radios back. <laughs>